What's up, everybody? This is Tom Taylor with South China Morning Post, uh, and I'm joined this morning or afternoon or evening, depending where you are in the world, by the boss man himself, Chatri Sitchudong. Chatri, a uh, very busy, exciting time for you right now. One X is just around the corner, one championship's 10th anniversary, Bonanza. How are you feeling right now? What are the stress levels like? Uh, how are you doing? You know, my stress levels are actually pretty low. Uh, I have such a phenomenal team uh, that, you know, they've been executing like crazy. Of course, we're working hard, uh, but I think, you know, we've been planning this for a long while. So, of course, there are uncontrollable factors that make us uh, nervous, like COVID and stuff like that. But in terms of execution, we're all on point right now, uh, well ahead of plan and everything. And the athletes start arriving uh, over the weekend. Awesome. Well, uh, of course, I want to dedicate most of our time today to talking about 1X. Before we get to that, though, I just wanted to ask you a few quick questions about last weekend's card, uh, namely... Um, what you think is next for for Bibiano Fernandez? Of course, you know one of one championship's both most dominant champions, you know a real uh, veteran of this organization, and he experienced a, a pretty tough loss. It was something we're not used to seeing. Any thoughts on the way that went down and what the future holds you know, for him? You know, ultimately, this the fight game is a young man's game, and Bibiano at forty one years old. You know, I had a feeling that uh, John Lineker might be able to pull this off just because of Bibiano's age right i mean it's one of those things your reflexes your skills deteriorate without you knowing it and, and there can be a sudden drop um uh that being said i also think that bibiano you know had the wrong game plan in terms of standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with with Lindiger. but again uh, i think ultimately the loss is due to father time and you know Lindiger is 10 years younger so his cardio is going to be better his reflex is going to be better he's going to be faster sharper um, and, and that ultimately uh, is what played, uh, you know, for the fight. Now, what's in the future for Bibiano? I spoke to him a day after the fight. He's obviously heartbroken. Um, and, you know, he says it's, he's far from done. He'll take the 90-day medical suspension for the KO and regroup. And, you know, he's thinking about doing something, you know, submission grappling uh, match in, in one. Uh, but he definitely wants a rematch with Lineker. And he thinks that uh, he's uh, going to be able to fix his mistakes. And so let's see. So, again, Bibiano's body of work over the last 20 plus years, you know, a multiple time Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world champion. And genu genuinely, genuinely, he is uh, one of the greatest bantamweight world champions in the history of the sport, you know, globally, uh, anybody. And when he was in his prime, he could finish anybody in the sport. Um, but again, it's a young man's game. Absolutely. It's uh, hard to argue with any of that. Um, while we're on the topic of people who came up short in big fights on that event, um, Gary Tonin, of course, experienced the first loss of his professional MMA career. Uh, any sense of what the, the road ahead looked like for, for him? So Gary uh, and I spoke briefly. Uh, he wants to get back in there. So I said, hey, you know, you got to take the 90-day medical suspension. Please don't spar. Don't train. Nothing to the head, you know, after getting uh, brutally knocked out like that. And Gary, he's such a game, game athlete. He wants to fight a top five contender right away. And he wants to get, he's like thinking that what's the fastest way back uh, for a title shot. And I said, you're going to have to fight the top five guys, you know, two or three of them and, and, and defeat them convincingly. Um, you know, had he lost a close decision on points to Tanle, then he might have been able to get a, an automatic rematch. Um, just because he really is a phenom, you know, uh, obviously he is a, um, you know, a world champion grappler, but he really is a phenom, his athleticism, his explosiveness, his killer instincts, his skills, um, and he's under the careful tutelage of uh, a, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, John Danaher, who I have tremendous amount of respect for as a coach, as a master, as a uh, expert martial artist. Mm -hmm. Well said. I, I certainly can't wait to see what's next for those guys. Um, but enough about the past. Let's let's look to the future here. Uh, very big show coming up for you guys. One X, just a blockbuster from every possible vantage point. So good it had to be divided into three parts, like Lord of the Rings. Um, I mean, let's let's run through some of the big fights here. Uh, yeah. so let's start with Stamp versus Angela. Um, would you say this is the biggest uh, women's bout in one championship history? Yeah, definitely. This is definitely you know one of the biggest world title fights in the history of one. Uh, definitely the biggest female fight in the history of one. And, you know, I think many experts think it's a 50-50 fight. Um, but I give the edge to Stamp. And I think this is the first time in Angela's career where she's truly an underdog in my eyes. 
uh, where the odds are stacked against her. You know, in Stamp, you have a World Grand Prix atomweight world champion who has run, you know, the last two years has run through opponents um, and her confidence is sky high and her skills are razor sharp and upgrading. Every time I, I see Stamp, I'm just blown away by her improvement of her wrestling and her jiu-jitsu. And um, she's a world-class striker, world champion Muay Thai, world champion kickboxing, and she has KO power. Mm -hmm. Angela, you know, of course, La Angela is, you know, extraordinary, legendary for her heart, her skills, her talent. Um, but she's coming off a two-year layoff, pregnancy and motherhood. How does that impact her body? How does it impact her killer instincts? How does it impact her, you know, strength and conditioning? These are all big factors, you know, her, her reflexes, her timing. Um, and her willingness to get into a scrap. You know, these are all, you know, questions that, you know, reasonable fans or experts have of Angela. Um, and, uh, of course, Angela is a wizard on the ground, but, um, you know, a lot of question marks where a stamp, her confidence is sky high. Well said. I mean, a lot on the line for both women, a lot of variables at play here that are kind of impossible to, to discern until fight night. But, you know, having said that, the, the big storyline is that, or for me, at least one of the big storylines is that Stamp is striving to become a, a champion in three different sports here. She's won the titles in Muay Thai and kickboxing and is now gunning for that MMA title. Um, for people, you know, for the layman, as a guy who's been around combat sports his whole life, why is that a significant accomplishment? Well, it's the first time in history, right? Um, and, and Stamp wants to be the first person in history to be a three-sport world champion. And, and that's the unique thing about one. You know, our platform, because we have all the different major different martial arts, like, again, uh, mixed martial arts, but we have kickboxing, we have Muay Thai, we have submission grappling. We've even held world title boxing matches on, on our platform. And we've had Lutwe and Silat and, and, and a various different martial arts over the years. So... You know, as a martial artist, you're able to express yourself in and create your own history and your own brand, so to speak. Kind of like the Ruo Tolo brothers who recently joined uh, for submission grappling, but they want to do MMA and, and they want to be able to do both sports. And I empathize, you know, for me, I'm a lifelong martial artist, uh, 35 plus years of Muay Thai experience. And I'm still and I still train, you know, five to six times a week. And uh, but I picked up jujitsu uh, many years ago. Uh, in 2005 and um, so I even for me I, I love evolving and growing and learning and, and becoming a better martial artist even with time and, and obviously um, martial arts is a young man's game but I still feel like I'm a, I'm a better martial artist today than I was you know when I was a kid so I think that kind of mindset is uh, what Stamp has coming into this she's like you know yeah I'm a Muay Thai veteran but I won world titles in this and I want to be an MMA world champion. So it's historic. If she beats Angela, you know, she's arguably the greatest female martial artist in history. You know, all the other greats are only in one sport. You know, can you win three world titles in three different sports, three different rule sets? That's unbelievable. So um, it's a testament to Stamps, you know, athleticism, her skill set, her rate of improvement, learning and growth uh, as a martial artist. Yeah, she really is just an incredible athlete, incredible martial artist. Um, speaking of incredible martial artists, we've got DJ versus Rod Tang on this card. Uh, this fight is completely insane, and I mean that in the best possible way. It's, it seems like something my friends would dream up after you know playing too much Street Fighter and maybe having a few beers or something. Uh, yeah. How did this come together? I mean, whose brainchild was this? How did this happen? So this was the brainchild of our uh, VP of social media and content, which is Matt Connolly. Um, he has a, you know, he has a brilliant mind and he has all these crazy ideas all the time. Um, some of them are just impossible to pull off and some of them are just crazy, but worth pulling off. And so when he came up with this idea, you know, the whole competition team, Matt Hume and, and, and Rick out and everybody embraced it very quickly. And it's just one of those things that has massive intrigue because you have two red hot athletes who are arguably you know, rank amongst the goats of their respective sports, but would never otherwise meet unless you had a special rule set. So first round Muay Thai, third round Muay Thai, second round MMA, fourth round MMA, three minutes apiece. Uh, and so what makes it so intriguing for me is in round one, 
there's immense pressure on road time to go for the KO. There's immense pressure for DJ not to get KO'd. In round two, that scenario switches completely where there's immense pressure for DJ to finish by sub or KO and road time not to get caught in any of that. So it, it's just one of these dynamics is, you know, rarely do you have a fight where you know one or the other will have to be an aggressor or defender very quickly and, and, and with time and pressure consequences. So it's just, you know, if you're a fight fan, this is just one of those things that are mind blowing, you know? And, and I can see it. I can see Rotang hitting DJ in a way that DJ's never been hit before because he's a world world champion striker with KO power. Um, you know, you can say, again, when you look at the mixed martial artists who have a striking background, all over the world, whether it's, you know, in, in the UFC or Bellator, 99% of them are not world-class strikers. They are good strikers who, who are MMA fighters, who are outstanding MMA fighters, let's say. So again, DJ's never met someone of this caliber face-to-face -face in striking. So it really is going to be intriguing to see how does DJ handle it. On the flip side, Rotang has never faced someone like of DJ's caliber in mixed martial arts. In fact, you know, Rotang has zero martial, mixed martial arts experience. The speed, the fluidity, the submission skills of DJ, you know, that, that's what makes him the GOAT. In my mind, if you look at all the mixed martial arts GOATs, so whether it's uh, a GSP or, or a Khabib or a Demetrius Johnson, if you look at skill set, pound for pound, just skill set, raw skill set, DJ has the best skill set. He has the best balance. The, the, he's the fastest. He's the slickest submission skills, the transition between striking and wrestling and, and grappling, his cage work, um, his balance. You know, everything makes DJ the GOAT in terms of pure martial arts skill. Now, we can argue about, you know, who had the tougher competition or, you know, what era they were in. But again, you know, these GOAT discussions always have a, a different factor. So I just like to look at pure skill set and say, as a lifelong martial artist, when I look at DJ's skills and I'm like, man, there, there are no holes. As you said, you know, these two guys are both at the, the top of their fields, but a very different challenge than either of them are used to. This is the kind of challenge neither of them have ever been offered before. Uh, now, I'm guessing it was your competition team that actually reached out with about offers, not you making these calls. But did you get a sense of what the initial reactions were from these guys when this bout was first proposed? They, it's amazing. They both verbally agreed right away from what I understand. And then they, they took a day to actually sign the bout agreements. But I mean, they, they were all game crazy. I mean, the, you know, but it, it also just shows you the mindset, right. Mm -hmm. Of both DJ and Rotang because they're such monsters in their respective sports, that confidence carries through in, in different rule sets. And again, with one, we, we have that flexibility. So you're going to see a lot of other crazy potential stories coming out. Uh, in the future, right? Uh, special rules matches or, you know, cross, you know, multi-sport world champions. And that's what the platform gives as, as one. You know, we're the only global organization in the world that showcases, you know, mixed martial arts, kickboxing, Muay Thai, and submission grappling at the highest levels in the world, right? With the greatest world champions, with the greatest uh, legendary names and, 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 and athletes. They're, just look at the the list of goats we have for those respective sports, but look at the roster of world champions we have from other organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. Our team and I did a did, did a quick calculation. We have you know 170 athletes who held world titles in prior organizations before joining one. Um, so that's a caliber that we have out of the 600 plus athletes we have, and that's the highest by far, absolute or percentage wise. Uh, of any global organization, if you compare it to the UFC or you compare it to Bellator, we have the most world championship martial artists who have won multiple world titles prior to joining one. A lot of talk ahead of this fight about what will be next for DJ, you know, whether he wins or loses. Uh, a lot of people, though, are also very interested in what might be next for Rod Tang. Uh, namely, you know, might this be the sort of precursor warm up round to his transition into MMA? Is that something that you guys are interested in making happen? You know, we, we, we try to work with the athletes with what they want. Uh, so, you know, Rotang has expressed interest in MMA in the future. I don't think he fully comprehends, or maybe he does, how difficult that transition is. 
just because you have to have, you know, a, a really deep understanding of wrestling and you have to have a really deep understanding of submission skills. And it takes time. It, you know, it just takes time. Um, it's not one of these things that you can just, oh, well, that's how you do an armbar. That's how you escape. There are, right. you know, with grappling, there's a real uh, sensitivity, you know, when you grapple with somebody and you have to develop that sensitivity and that intuition through experience of many subs and, uh, you know, many attempts of subs and many and getting finished many times, you know, that is a different thing. But I guess, you know, that sensitivity is also with striking, right? Rotang has over 300 professional fights in, in striking. So he has that sensitivity, the same thing. He can he can read and see things as an opponent plays out. And, and this is one of the things that that's incredible about world champion martial artists is that they just need a few minutes to read someone's game. And then, boom, they go into overdrive and they're able to, you know, break some someone apart. Um, and I've seen it over and over, you know, throughout my career uh, as a martial artist. Moving on to, you know, the many other attractions on this card, there are a couple of grappling matches on this card that people are talking about a lot. Um, I, you probably addressed this already, but is the plan sort of as you're signing these grapplers and doing more and more grappling matches to sort of open a, a submission grappling chapter of Super Series or something? Yeah, I mean, you know, one is the home of martial arts and, you know, it's never been about MMA only, right? It's about getting the greatest martial arts on the planet, building the largest uh, organization in the world for martial arts and having that platform. Um, and I think fans really appreciate that. You know, it's not that, uh, yes, we compete with UFC, but it's a totally different product. It's a totally different fan experience. Um, yet it's the best of the best in the world competing. And I think that's the intrigue factor that fans love, but also, um, you know, that's what makes us very different. In, in addition to our, you know, there's many other, many other differences between us and UFC, but, you know, UFC is the world's largest MMA organization. We're the world's largest martial arts organization. And so submission grappling is just a natural extension. I mean, it, it all started with Gary Tonin many years ago, or even further back with Shinya Oki, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then it, we added Gordon Ryan and, and, and Gushesha and, you know, a bunch of other names. And so, yeah, I mean, our, our roster of grappling talent is by far the best in the world. A lot of great Adam Waite fights on this card, of course, the main event and, and several others. It's a real showcase for this amazing division. Uh, one of the best Adam Waite fights in the bill, of course, is Denise and uh, Ham So Hee. Uh, is it safe to assume that's that's the number one contender fight in this division? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Whoever wins, uh, you know, Seo Hee Ham or, or, or Denise uh, will challenge the winner of Angela and Stamp. Of course, I guess that assumes that, you know, nothing crazy happens in the Angela Stamp fight. It's not, you know, a razor close split decision or something. You never know. You know, I, I do believe that uh, our women's atom weight division is the best, most stacked female division on the planet. Like there is like raw skill set, just um, looking at, you know, the top 16 athletes. And if you talk the top five, they're definitely, definitely the best in the world. Uh, and it's so stacked. It's just, it's just one of these divisions that, you know, if I were an athlete, I'd, I'd hate to be in because it's just, you, you look left, there's a monster. You look right, there's a monster. Um, yeah, the, the one atom weight division is the most stacked female division, pound for pound, uh, on the planet of any organization. Yeah, I was actually just speaking to some uh, fellow reporters about that exact thing a little while ago, and we were talking about how it would be cool to see, you know, this division in particular set up and kind of like, uh, you know, drive to survive the Netflix show about F1, kind of that sort of scenario, an in-depth look at all these, you know, interesting fighters and their journeys and stuff. It's just a fascinating division. Uh, I'll stop ranting about it now, though. That's um, a great <laughs> idea, Tom. I hadn't even thought about, you know, I mean, obviously, we've been approached many times for a, a documentary kind of stuff. And. Uh, we're definitely open. You know, we have a, a general entertainment uh, division called One Studios uh, that obviously did The Apprentice, but we are obviously looking at other content stacks. So, um, yeah, definitely, that would be actually a, a fascinating one. Maybe if we did if we did another World Grand Prix next year. Um, but the storylines, you're right. The Adamway division is so stacked, and there's so many intri intriguing storylines. Um, you know, amongst the again the greatest female roster on the planet. Yeah, it's an, an incredible roster and just uh, so many great stories, as you said. Um, moving on, there's a lot of talk about John Wayne Parr heading into this card. You guys have sort of given him the platform to close out his career, which is amazing. This will, of course, be the last fight of his career. His opponent, Edward Falang, is not quite generating the same buzz, but but he also has a pretty amazing history in combat sports. Actually headlined the first one championship card 
back in 2011, and he's still here competing on the 10th anniversary show. What are your thoughts on this guy's incredible longevity in this organization? Edward Falang is just one of those guys who's truly a martial artist at heart, you know, um, and, and obviously martial arts helped him escape poverty. His incredible life story. Um, his parents were in the bottom rungs of society, you know, earning, you know, a dollar a day, nine kids, five of his siblings passed away from sickness because they couldn't afford medical health care. Just an incredible life, but martial arts, he was lucky to find martial arts and it transformed his life and he's inspired an entire nation of the Philippines. Um, you know, he's had a rough go in the last several fights at, you know, as again, it's a young man's game. At the same time, I do believe Edward has one more final world championship run in him in mixed martial arts. Um, I think it's it's a good breakaway from martial arts, uh, mixed martial arts to focus on, you know, striking. Uh, it's a tall order to fight a legend like John Wayne Parr. At the same time, I do believe that Edward is the faster, stronger, more powerful striker because he's younger, um, mm -hmm. almost 10 years younger than John Wayne Parr. Of course, John Wayne is seasoned, grizzled veteran, world championship striker. So it's a very intriguing storyline as well. You know, I know a lot of experts are giving John Wayne Parr the, the nod in terms of being the favorite. I, I'm not sure he's the favorite in this fight. It's, it's a great fight, a very compelling matchup, and that's a great breakdown. Um, I'd love to talk to you about every single fight on this card, but but we'll be here till this time tomorrow if we do that. So uh, let me just, just ask you this. I mean, if you take off your promoter hat for a second, I don't know if that's it that you're wearing there, and put on your fan hat, which fights on this bill are you most excited for? Oh, that's a tough one, man. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I love so many of the fights. I'm, I'm very excited for Andre Galvao's debut, especially against Renier. I think Renier is crazy. He is a legit, I mean, Renier is a legit black belt, but you know, there are levels of black belt, you know, um, you, just because you have a black belt in jiu-jitsu does not mean you're, you're equivalent. I mean, I've rolled with regular black belts and I've rolled with world championship black belts and there is a massive difference um so i think Renier is crazy he either knows something i don't about jujitsu which i just don't think he does but or, or he's just crazy my prediction is andre galvao is going to run through him uh it's it, it's jujitsu obviously if it was mma uh Renier would run through andre galvao but it's jujitsu man and, and andre is a beast i'm very intrigued by that and uh, that should be a fun, fun fight for our, all fans. I'm also intrigued by Daniel Kelly's debut against Mei Yamaguchi, two elite black belts, um, you know, on the biggest stage of martial arts. Um, I'm really excited for Superwoman versus Marat, you know, uh, for the world title, for the featherweight kickboxing world title. Superbon obviously is the current hottest featherweight on the planet after knocking out Jojo Petrojan, who's the GOAT of mm -hmm. kickboxing. But Marat knocked out Super Bowl in one round, I think in less than a minute, maybe it's two minutes, um, a few years ago. So that's definitely a loss that Super Bowl wants to avenge. But man, Marat is, he's got dynamite in his hands. You know, he is a Mike Tyson of kickboxing. And uh, obviously, Angela Lee and, 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 and Stan Fairtex, I'm super excited. DJ and Rotang. Uh, man, I can go on and on. The, the card is just so stacked. Um, I'm excited for C.O. Hiham and Denise Sambuanga. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's almost like, um, I can't, you know, I, sometimes I pinch myself. The fact that we're throwing a card, three cards rather for a 10th year anniversary show that goes from 1 PM in the afternoon to 11 PM at night. And I would be sitting cage side, you know, watching the greatest martial arts on the planet, five world title fights, one world grand prix, one super fight with the special rules, but every other fight is between world championship Athletes, there's no, there is no prelim here, right? So it's like literally straight 21 fights of world championship caliber, the highest levels in the world with super intriguing storylines. It's, yeah, it, you know, it's a, it's a dream for me. Like, I'm like, man, that's what I think. I was saying to you right before the interview began, Tom, I think this is one of those events that will stand the test of time. Five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years from now, all of us, 
we'll be talking about it to our children or grandchildren. Um, I think it's going to be like a pride shockwave. It's absolutely historic. You know, never before has there ever been a major global promotion to host, uh, you know, world championship athletes, world championship title fights across, you know, MMA, Muay Thai, kickboxing, submission, grappling. Um, if you love martial arts, if you love combat sports, this is one of those moments in history that truly, um, it, you know, it's epic. And our viewership numbers are definitely going to break all record historical highs uh, for us. Uh, we are already gauging it from the social media interaction. We can see it. Um, this will be the most watched one event in the history of one. And uh, so it's just one of those epic moments that if you're there live in the stadium or whether you're watching live on broadcast, I promise you it's it's one of those most magical moments in the history of martial arts that will go down and, and, and stand the test of time. Again, no one's ever done something like this at this scale, at the highest levels in the world. The whole world will be watching this one. Definitely. It's an incredible card. I, I'm giddy over here. I can't wait to watch it. Um, Just a few more questions for you, Chatri, before I let you go. I know you're a very busy man, particularly these, these days. Um, this is the 10th anniversary celebration, of course. You know, it's a, an opportunity for a bit of reflection. Uh, are there any moments of, of the first 10 years of, of one championship that stand out as like real victories, real highlights? And then on the flip side, any, you know, learning experiences, low moments that you're going to be looking to avoid in the next decade? I, I really feel that one X is going to mark the very beginning of the one story. Um, the last 10 years was really just building the foundation of the business, you know, getting it off the ground with lots of challenges. Like, you know, I've, I've always said in, in interviews, the first three years were a complete disaster at one. We were rejected a thousand times, thousand failures every day. You know, broadcasters didn't want us. Brands didn't want us. Governments didn't want us. Athletes didn't want to join. Media didn't care about us. Fans didn't care. About, it was just a disaster the first three years of one. But today, you know, you know, the fact that we are the world's largest martial arts organization, the fact that we have, you know, fans all over the world, the fact that we have a live broadcast in 154 countries, just mind boggling to me. Um, and if you look at our social media numbers, I just I'm blown away the fact that we're number one in the world out of 5000 sports properties in terms of organic video views on Facebook. So just these kind of metrics, that's just never, you know, imagine. But at the same time, I look at it and like we have the foundation now to build something spectacular over the next 10 years. So for me, again, it, my team and I, we truly believe this is just the beginning of our story. We've built the foundation. We've got the business on the ground. It's a truly global sports property in the top 10 in terms of viewership and engagement numbers uh, as per Nielsen. And now it's going to be the fun part. The next 10 years is, you know, our numbers continue to climb and I get the, the, the viewership and social media and digital metrics uh, across all platforms, TV, et cetera, every week. And our numbers just it's exponential. I mean, these charts are like vertical. If you look on a one-year basis, three-year basis or five-year basis, the numbers are vertical. And that's a far cry from the first year, first three years of our business where there were, you know, the numbers were flatlined. Um, so, Again, I'm so pumped and I'm so grateful to our incredible roster, our incredible team. And, you know, I hope to put on a spectacular show that fans will remember for many decades to come um, as their favorite martial arts show come Saturday. I think you can probably rest assured that will happen. Um, you know, it's been a pleasure watching one championship grow over the years, Chatri. I've been covering this show since just about the very beginning. Uh, wow. Last question for you before I let you go. Yes. One XX in, you know, 10 years time, the 20 year anniversary, long way off. This might be impossible to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What fight is headlining that card? What do you think? <laughs> 10 years from now. <laughs> You know, I'd have I mean, to, we got Victoria Lee. I, yeah, exactly. I'd have to get into one of the young guns. You know, we we, we have a, a lot of, you know, the rural Tolo brothers are 18 years old. Uh, phenom athletes and phenom world championship jiu-jitsu taros. But they're transitioning to MA. I, I have no doubt that they have a bright, bright future, world championship future. Um, if I had to predict, um, 1XX would be the rural Tolo brothers, <clears throat> both um, – going for their world titles or defending their world titles. Um, yeah, that, that's what I would predict. <laughs> All right. Well, no crystal ball, so it's a hard thing to say. But uh, but I really appreciate the time, as always, Chatri. Congratulations on, on 10 amazing years with one championship. Th thanks so much, Tom. I appreciate it. Take care, buddy.